So first, we're going to start with a project that is um, derived from the pandemic experience we all just are currently still living through. Uh, the pandemic within the pandemic increased in intimate partner violence and abuse during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is Eva Cheska DeAngelis. And then afterward, um, if you stick around, we're happy to have a little bit of a conversation about it. This is the capstone project for Evacheska DeAngelis for Psychology 499, entitled The Pandemic Within the Pandemic, Increase in Intimate Partner Violence and Abuse During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Introduction. There has been a significant increase in intimate partner violence and abuse, or IPV and IPAV, during the COVID-19 pandemic, with pandemic pressures and stresses yielding increases in known forms of IPV and IPAV, and also in new forms of IPV and IPAV as per pandemic-related mental health issues, substance use, misuse and addiction, reduced access to help and care, financial stress, job loss or change, required and varying cohabitation, crowding, isolation, lockdown, quarantine, and of course, other pandemic-related conditions and behaviors. It is important to address and learn from these effects as this may not be the only pandemic or other lockdown situation that we see in our society or in our world, and it may not be the only thing we face in these modern times in this nature. And also, these effects of this markedly increased IPV and IPAV will be requiring attention more and more for years to come. Over the course of this presentation, I will share definitions. I will discuss the abuse of power in intimate partner violence and intimate partner abuse. I'll share how the nature of IPV and IPAV places victims and survivors at risk. We'll discuss other contributors to pandemic IPV and IPAV. I'll share possible solutions, a summary and conclusion. And then lastly, you will be able to peruse references and photo credits on your own. Beginning with intimate partner violence and abuse definitions. While the term intimate partner violence, IPV, is growing in use, the previous term, domestic violence, also remains in use. Also frequently used in discussions of IPV and DV is the term violence against women, or VAW, although this term includes more than what takes place between partners in relationships or past relationships. Additionally, there are those experts in these fields who are now proposing and using the term intimate partner violence and abuse, or IPAV. This report utilizes the terms IPV and IPAV and at times is also referring to DV or domestic violence. This complex problem has a complex background. IPV and IPAV has been a significant problem throughout history and most definitively here in modern times. Risk factors for IPV and IPAV have increased during the COVID-19 pandemic as have rates of IPV and IPAV. Studies are finding marked increases in both rates of and severity of IPV and IPAV during this pandemic. New risk factor complexities are emerging all the time. Furthermore, we see an abuse of power and control in IPV and IPAV. The battering of female partners in intimate partner relationships has been recognized as a public health problem in the United States and in many other nations. Globally, one in three women are experiencing forms of physical and sexual violence in their lives. In the United States alone, millions of women are affected by this domestic violence each year. And abuse and violence against women has significant and damaging effects. Where this intimate partner violence is recurring, there are serious risks for the development of severe psychiatric disorders. It is essential that we seek to understand how the abuse of power and control so common in IPV and IPAV has been exacerbated during the pandemic. IPV and IPAV have long been taking place as an abuse of power and control in troubled relationships. Frequently, those who are using violence to control and to hold on to or gain power in a relationship find the threat of violence and actual violence to be their most effective means of control of their partner. Furthermore, the pandemic situation is prompting abuse. The COVID-19 pandemic situation has been and still can be prompting the abuser's drive to secure and maintain and to take action to expand power over the partner. Coercive control is a strategy for control via what's called oppressive conduct, which includes ongoing physical abuse and sexual coercion, along with intimidation, degradation, isolation, and other forms of control tactics. Pandemic levels of social isolation and of uneven social isolation are further fueling abuse in IPV and IPAV situations. 
During this pandemic, abusers have found the general increase in isolation as an opportunity for further control, including further social and physical isolation of the person being abused. Worldwide, it has been seen that during this pandemic, there has been an increase in coercive control by the persons abusing. Around the world, this control is a predictor of femicide, with the pandemic conditions increasing probability of control tactics progressing to physical abuse, even to femicide. Additionally, where there are financial stressors, such as job loss, these financial stressors are powerful accelerators of IPV and IPAV, for example, in the form of financial abuse. Knowing all of this, it is essential that we gain an understanding of how the nature of IPV and IPAV itself places victims and survivors at risk of this COVID pandemic related violence. The IPV and IPAV problem was already prevalent before the pandemic and continues to be so now. IPV is prevalent worldwide and is largely not well understood. Although there was what appeared to be a drop in cases of IPV prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the data indicating the drop have been questioned. Rates of IPV and IPAV have remained high and much of it remains widely unreported. All of the ongoing issues found in the ongoing IPV and IPAV prior to the pandemic have continued, including but not limited to these. There is frequent delegitimization of victims or survivors of IPV. There is frequent shame and hiding that victims or survivors engage in. There are frequently social views that the victim or survivor is responsible. There are what sound like conflicting labels such as survivor and batterer, DV services and treatment community, or victim and offender or perpetrator, law enforcement and judicial settings. The short and long-term physical health and mental health effects of IPV and IPAV are frequently not seen. Frequently, severe long-term effects of IPV and IPAV are experienced, yet many times they are misunderstood or they're even hidden. Many women experience lifelong effects of the IPV and IPAV that they have experienced earlier in their lives. Fields such as medicine, psychology, social work, and others are still detecting additional aspects of previously unrecognized impacts of the IPV and IPAV experience, such as frequently unforeseen post-traumatic stress, undetected depression, and the current or later in life arising of other mental and physical health issues. We must recognize and make known this reality that since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, rates of ongoing and new IPV and IPAV have significantly increased. Not only has there been an increase, but the severity of the IPV that has been occurring has increased as well. Fumzio Mlambo Nguka, Executive Director of UN Women, notes that even before the COVID-19 pandemic existed, domestic violence was already one of the greatest human rights violations. The incidence of this human rights violation has increased. During the COVID-19 pandemic, already high rates of intimate partner violence have increased in the US and around the world. So let's discuss novel or new IPV and IPAV appearing during this pandemic. There has been a high rate of novel or new cases of IPV during this pandemic. The term novel cases refers to cases of IPV where there was no previous IPV. Studies are showing that some 60% of cases of IPV occurring during the pandemic are or were novel or new cases. Additionally, new levels of and even new forms of pandemic-related IPV not previously recognized have emerged. This is a sort of new forms of IPV and IPAV pandemic in and of itself within the general IPAV and IPV increased pandemic within the COVID-19 pandemic. So a pandemic within a pandemic within a pandemic, if you will. COVID-specific coercive control behaviors have also appeared. The persons doing the abusing, the batterers, the perpetrators, have often applied new forms of pandemic-related abuse, including demanding that partners do things exposing themselves to COVID-19. Along with these pressures in the ostracism of the partner who seeks to practice contagion prevention rather than be exposed to COVID, such as publicly mocking a partner for washing their hands, falsely informing others that the partner is infected with COVID, and barring the partner from seeking medical care when COVID sy symptoms appear. Note that where there was pre-existing IPV, 34% of the IPV that has taken place during this pandemic has been more severe than previous IPV in that relationship. Some groups are experiencing even higher rates of IPV and IPAV. Among the numerous groups who have experienced the new and or increased in severity IPV and IPAV during this pandemic are these. 
women who are essential workers, persons with recent changes in employment status, unemployed persons, persons ha having difficulty paying rent, women who are testing positive for COVID-19, pregnant women, and also mothers of new babies and young toddlers. Note that some 25% of those experiencing IPV are being subjected to this IPV by a former partner who is frequently either still involved or still present and or still abusing and or stalking, including both physical stalking and cyber stalking. There are numerous causes of and contributors to this problem. This has been called the shadow pandemic. IPV and IPAV in a pandemic situation arises as a result of numerous economic factors, as well as disaster-related instability, increased exposure to exploitative relationships, and reduced options for support. It is essential that we see isolation aggravates vulnerabilities, both collective and personal. In general, disasters exacerbate. During this pandemic, not only increased isolation, crowding, and restriction of lifestyles, but also growing financial stress have been specific exacerbators of IPV and IPAV. Anxiety, depression, PTSD, suicidality. Women who have experienced domestic violence and other forms of intimate partner violence show significant long-term and even lifelong mental health, physical health, as well as economic effects. Women who have experienced intimate partner violence by their male partners, spouses, significant others, experience significant mental health impacts including anxiety, depression, depressive symptoms, disassociation, PTSD, suicidality, and high rates of substance abuse and addiction. Also note that mental health coercion in IPV and IPAV is all too common. Sex coercion in IPV and IPAV settings can involve efforts to undermine a partner's emotional well-being, and even general sense of sanity, and where there is substance addiction, even the partner's sobriety. This frequently includes the controlling partner blocking the partner who seeks mental health care from getting this care, such as being able to attend appointments online or in person. Where there are substance abuse issues such as addiction, this coercion can also include interfering with or blocking the partner's addiction and recovery practices and blocking the use of the partner's addiction recovery medication. This coercion can also include discrediting the partner in the courts and with first responders where they were called to protect the victims of IPV and also with helping professionals. Another key area of such coercion is what is termed reproductive coercion, which is enacting power and control over a partner by controlling decisions about contraceptives and pregnancy, also including forcing sex and pregnancy on a partner. Mental health and mental health care have been and are being restricted by abusive partners during the pandemic. There has been and is the rising of an increasing in severity of this mental health coercion, which includes the abuser's use of control regarding the partner's mental health. Such mental health coercion is seen in threats and forced to control a partner, prevent a partner from using prescriptions, gaslighting a partner, telling that partner that she is crazy or mentally ill, lying about the partner to law enforcement, courts, and helping professionals. Here we will discuss possible solutions. The following is the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Peace is not just the absence of war. Many women under lockdown for COVID-19 face violence where they should be safest in their own homes. Today, I appeal for peace in homes around the world. I urge all governments to put women's safety first as they respond to the pandemic. Just like the Secretary General of the United Nations, experts in numerous fields have been addressing the shadow pandemic, this IPV and IPAV pandemic during the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of what has been and is being done is done under the pressure of this pandemic, a health and mental health situation we were not and still are not prepared for. Responding to the market increase in IPV and IPAV during the COVID-19 pandemic has first required raising awareness that this is actually taking place. This also requires raising awareness that the effects of this pandemic-related increase in IPV and IPAV will continue for years, decades to come, long after this pandemic ends. Agencies, health and mental health care personnel, law enforcement, educators, and others are not fully prepared for this reality. Every effort must be made to address this need for information, training, and resources. Women who are experiencing IPV and IPAV continue to need, and even more so now do need, safe ways to inquire about and receive help for protection. 
It is essential to be bringing forward and disseminating an understanding of the wide range of mental health consequences of IPV and IPAV, and of these consequences even more so now as per this pandemic, as its effects will be significant, and some even severe and very long lasting. Mental health emergencies such as this must be better understood. Disaster management is essential in situations such as this. We must continue to assist the mental health of DV advocates, mental health care providers, first responders, etc. We must also be addressing the IPV and IPAV disaster related survivor guilt being experienced on so many levels. We must be addressing the short and long term individual, collective and historical trauma resulting from this COVID-19 pandemic and from the shadow pandemic of the COVID-19 pandemic related IPV and IPAV. We must be developing and teaching advanced strategies to promote further resilience to this dual, if not triple pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic related IPV and IPAV pandemic, and the appearance and exacerbation of new and novel forms of pandemic specific IPV, IPAV. Here we will discuss summary and conclusions. In summary, there has been a significant increase in intimate partner violence and abuse during the COVID-19 pandemic. With the pandemic pressures and stresses yielding increases in known forms of IPV and IPAV and also in new forms of IPV and IPAV as per pandemic related mental health issues, substance use, misuse and addiction, reduced access to help and care, financial stress, job loss or change, required and varying cohabitation, crowding isolation, lockdown and quarantine and other pandemic related conditions and behaviors. The market increase in IPV and IPAV during the COVID-19 pandemic has been documented. This COVID-19 pandemic has been instrumental in alerting us to issues that may not have been seen as central before. The problem of lack of access to care has been highlighted in terms of medical issues, which is serious in and of itself. Now, during this pandemic, challenging pandemic and quarantine conditions have increased in incidents, including forced cohabitation, crowding, lockdown, isolation, variations in public messaging regarding contagion, requirements, advice, safety, with all of this resulting in confusion and insecurity. And there has been reduced access to help, mental and physical health care, first responders, educators, community services, etc. These conditions have contributed to the increase in social, economic and psychological stress mental health problems, increased substance, drug and alcohol use, misuse and addiction, increased abuse and violence, and related short and long term mental and physical health effects and dangers of all of the above. During this pandemic, there has also been an increase in other conditions that themselves contribute to IPV and IPAV, such as substance and alcohol use and abuse, along with psychological conditions such as PTSD and depression. And there are many unforeseen consequences that we will be experiencing for years, even decades to come. While this COVID-19 pandemic has been taking place, the underlying problems such as the market increase in intimate partner violence and abuse have been largely ignored or underestimated or unaddressed. This significant increase in intimate partner violence and abuse during the COVID-19 pandemic has been described as the shadow pandemic. We know that this shadow pandemic is very serious and that it is a pandemic within the pandemic. Abuse and violence against women take place across a range of socio-cultural and religious variations. In fact, domestic violence takes place throughout all demographics and cultures. No one social group is free of this abuse and violence against women. Historically, around the world, the acceptance of abuse and violence against wives has been found not only to be accepted, but even protected. While social norms have changed and society's views of domestic violence have changed, we have a long way to go both nationally and internationally. So while these issues are being addressed more and more nowadays, the full range of actual mental health consequences of this abuse and violence remains unseen. Domestic abuse and violence, intimate partner relationship abuse and violence is still taking place. While this may appear to have been reduced in some areas and populations, what is becoming more clear is that this abuse and violence against women continues. Some of this abuse and violence against women is becoming more subtle, taking less visible forms. Other of this abuse and violence against women continues to be visible and even allowed in many parts of the world. There are lifelong effects on the development of the adult who has been abused by an intimate partner. These effects have yet to be fully measured and understood. Where children have also been abused in the context of abuse and violence against their mothers, these potential consequences are also still to be fully measured and understood. Experiencing ongoing domestic intimate partner abuse and violence can result in long-term effects on the development of mental health in adulthood, 
and even upon overall healthy emotional, social, financial, physical, adulthood development. Women who have been experiencing domestic violence and intimate partner violence are affected in many ways, physically with long-term health effects, emotionally with long-term mental health effects, financially with long-term financial effects, and in other serious ways that are less explicit. Ultimately, the progression of healthy adulthood development can be harmed through this shadow pandemic. Healthy life processes can be interfered with and even blocked. Clearly, far more work must be done to reduce and hopefully end the abuse of and violence against women in the United States and around the world. Ideally, further and farther reaching international efforts to change social norms on a global level will be developed with efforts to broadcast this work in all languages on the planet, efforts to make awareness and prevention of this abuse and violence a global effort, communicating to the world that we are all on board, all seeking to define, to stop, and to prevent further abuse of and violence against women. Thank you. I want to open it up now to any comments or questions. Um, I also want to mention that while Eva Cheska couldn't be here with us, her instructor, Dr. Chelsea Hansen, is here um, and is also willing to um, answer any questions that she can. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hansen for just a moment so she can just talk a little bit about the process that Eva Cheska went through to complete her project and she can give you a little bit more insight into how, you know, how she selected the topic and her interest in it. Okay, thank you, Carla. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just, I'm so, I just wanted to start by saying I'm so proud of Eva Cheska. I thought that was fantastic. And um, when she selected her topic, she knew really from the start of the course what she wanted to do, which was great um, and I find pretty rare. And she just uh, saw all of the trends during the pandemic um, about IPV and, you know, really dug into it. And what was amazing and what we want, you know, for our students in this part of their educational journeys is she really questioned the data that she saw. And I um, was very impressed by that. So, you know, one thing that we both noticed is that the data reflects a decrease in IPV in some ways during the pandemic. And you probably saw in her presentation, she mentioned that um, the data is questioned on that. Um, I saw this too, I do a lot of work in the special needs community. Um, and there were a lot of cases of child abuse uh, <clears throat> for children on the spectrum and things like that. But the overall rate of uh, physical child abuse is much lower during the pandemic. And Eva Cheska found this as well in general with all IPV. Uh, but there was also, you know, the reason that we're questioning it is there's a lot less reporting when you're in isolation. And so uh, she dug into that and um, found some of those nuances. And that's really why she's calling it the pandemic within the pandemic. So um, that's about all I can think of. Uh, she really did a great job, but she knew what she wanted to study from the start. So she was pretty passionate about this. Thanks, Kelsey. You know, uh, Leticia asked a question, which I thought was really interesting. She said, you know, did Evacheska think, um, and I don't know if you can answer this, um, about different kinds of abuse that took place and, you know, like adult children abusing their parents, et cetera, you know, um, how did the focus come to be on intimate parlor violence? She didn't share that. That just was her idea from the start. Um, but there are so many, um, d you know, different areas you could go into with this. So that's a great question. I'm not totally sure, but she did start specifically with uh, intimate partner violence. Great. Thank you. And I see there are lots of comments um, about people learning new things. I'm sure the student, we're going to share the, the video with her so that she can see your um, your comments. And um, and thank you to all of you who, who stopped by to see this presentation. 